Well, I have said to you before that I'm only too happy to assist you with uh, problems on painting and so on, if I'm able to do so. Of course, any advice and uh, critique is only going to be my opinion in the way that I work. So uh, you might like different work to me and uh, you, might, you may not even like my work. So that's your choice. All I can offer you is my own skill and experience. And in saying that, I've had a, I've had a subscriber just write to me and very kindly offered me a trip over to South Africa to stay with him and paint with him and become his personal tutor. So as he shows me around in return, we will paint together and um, film the whole trip. And we paint the same places and I would film both myself and him and how we progress, which would be, I hope, great for him and great for me to have a company and we should totally enjoy ourselves. It's a nice thought anyway, it's a nice dream for the future. In the meantime, and how this started, he sent me a few of his pictures, these ones, which I'll show you close up, and asked me my opinion and how he could improve them because he's concerned about colour intensity and the brightness and values of colours. And I certainly can help with that. But it also brings up other issues in these paintings. Um, it isn't just a matter of um, colour intensity, but there's also techniques and methods. How, for instance, in watercolour, if you don't mix them correctly, or you don't mix them a certain way, or you overwork them, they become muddy. How if we use the wrong colours together, again, they'll be muddy. The techniques of using the chemistry of colour, the colour circle, the brightness of colour, the tones, the lights and darks, rough and smooth, cool and warm, all of these things, I will now go into a video and he's given me permission to use his work and in my way, again I go back to my opinion, it may not be yours or his even, I will try and improve them to what he was after. We'll look at ways of making his paintings brighter, stronger, more about light. Having said that, one of the first things you have to do is if you're going to choose a composition and you're doing it from a photograph, then you must choose a good composition or change it around. Equally, if you want to copy another artist's work, Again, it's very personal taste to which artist you like and what work you like. Um, but if you're going to copy an artist, do try and choose a good one. Because I do find it very difficult when students come to me and they're trying to copy a poor artist's work. I mean, they're working, it's working against them from the very start, isn't it? If the work isn't good, if the artist isn't good, if the composition isn't good, if the painting or the techniques whatever aren't good, and they're trying to mimic that, all they're doing is on a losing battle. And, and I'm afraid, you know, with one or two of the paintings he's chosen, there are things there that wouldn't be in my taste at all, which we'll go into. Um, but that, again, is personal taste. I don't tell anybody what they must and mustn't paint. I'll simply help, to help you to try and do what you want. There are so many ways to paint. There are so many right answers. There are things that don't work. There are so many pigments. There are so many different types of paint. There are so many methods and techniques. But what I really want to concentrate here simply is how to keep clean, pure, bright colour. How to make those vibrant, rich effects with wonderful colours. To do this, you need to understand about colour chemistry, about colours themselves. How to mix colours. What colours make what other colours. Our basic first colours are the primary colours, the yellows, the reds, the blues. From those, all the other colours are made. Then we've got black and white, of course, which aren't true colours. We cannot make those colours by mixing. They are the starter colours. Most other colours can be made by mixing, but some just become muddy when they're mixed, so some colours have to be artificially made. Magenta or cobalt violet is a good example of this. You cannot mix this colour, really, so your choice of colours for your palette is quite important. Here are a couple of palettes that I use. The Impressionists ban black from their palette altogether because they realise that light is colour. That If you have yellow artificial light or blue daylight, it's affecting white and it's affecting black, which will then become colours. But in certain situations, black can be used very effectively. In mixing in watercolour, it can kill or deaden things and make them very sooty. So normally I don't use it. Learning to see in all ways takes practice, as does learning to see colour. Shadows aren't just black. Greys aren't just black and white. Darks are made of many different colours, cools and warms, as are the lights. Every single colour has a cool and warm hue. These different warms and cools are called hues, and we're going to go into this in more detail later. Here you can see an example of how I've used these warm and cool hues in the various greens for this particular painting. The main strings to our bow are warm against cool, light against dark and rough against smooth. All you have to do and the very basics are putting the right colours in the right places in the right shapes relevant one to another. And it's as simple as that. Every single colour has an opposite in the colour circle which is called a complementary colour. These colours complement each other by making each other stand out. In other words, if I place red next to green, the red will seem brighter and the green will seem brighter than they are on their own. Here are some examples of that, and then how that can actually be used in paintings. In this particular painting, I've used acrylic inks and acrylic paints and oil paints. 
To get the effects of light or even fluorescent paint, we don't always use fluorescent paint, we use the warms against the cools and the opposites in the colour circle. In these Emperor Tetras, I've used the lights and darks and the warms and cools to get the effect of light on the fish's scales. Many artists have used this, including the famous John Constable. You see here in his paintings, in every single one of them, there is red used in the figures or on the horse's back and so on, just to bring out the greens in the painting. Always a small spot of red somewhere in these paintings to enhance the greens. Red being the opposite in the colour circle to the green. Here in these acrylic ink, water and pastels, I've used the different colour hues to try and make the colours sing one against another like an orchestra in music. Now the difference between luminous colours and fluorescent colours. Luminous give off light chemically. Fluorescent reflect light more than ordinary colours do. So fluorescent colours are much brighter in light, but in dull light they get duller. To get that effect of giving fluorescent, we need to use the effects of the opposites in the colour circle. Now that you begin to understand how one colour affects another in the opposites in the colour circle, we can begin to work on broken colour. So we can make dots of colour together appear to make one mixed colour. Rather than mixing red and yellow, for instance, we can put dots of red and yellow together and from a, di a distance it will appear to be orange because the eye will be fooled, the brain will be fooled. And of course if we're using various different colours that are opposites in the colour circle, this can give an even brighter effect. Both the French Impressionists and the Pointillists use this to great effect. Now let's look at how every single colour can have a warm and cool hue how reds can become more cool by becoming more purple, how blues can become more warm by becoming more purple, how greens can be a brown to be warm or an icy blue to be cooler. When we say that I mean fire as in red and ice as in cool. So that means I'd be making my ice with different blues and the cooler of the blues would be more towards turquoise and the warmer blues would be more towards purple. Here are some examples of my work where I deliberately do this, playing warms against cools here with the pheasants for instance, or here where I play lights against darks and warms against cools, and here where we've got medium tones and lights and darks and the warms against the cool to give the evening nighttime light. Brightness of colour or colour intensity are completely different to tone. Here's an example of that. Here you see a sheet of the colour circle and various colours in warms and cool shades. If we were to take a black and white photograph of that, those tones or those colours would be completely different. Yellow, for instance, goes down to almost a white or a light grey. And other colours that seem very bright in reality, actually in black and white or in tone, are quite dull. When you're going to paint silvers and golds, you don't use silver and gold paint, you simply paint those colours relevant one to another that you see, both tonally and in colour. If you do this, as with glass, those shapes will simply appear, those colours will show, it would look silver and gold or look glass. If you're having a problem separating out the tones, try it here on these sheets, where we've got tones of just one colour. I want you to squint down, and as you squint you cut the light out, and the darks become stronger, and the lights become stronger, and the middle tones start to merge together. You can see your tones more easily that way. In all of these pictures, I've used tonal varieties to gain the effect of light, mid-tones throughout the painting, and then strong lights and darks to get the effect of light shining through the birds. Here, strong lights and darks to get the shadows coming through the mountains. And in this next scene at night by the cafe, we've got the strong lights and darks to get the effect at night. The brighter the day, usually the greater the difference between the lights and the darks. So in this case, and in this very bright sunny one, I've deliberately made very strong lights and darks to give the effect of sunlight. The term transparent means that it's like glass so you can see through it. Some paints are transparent and some paints are opaque. Opaque means that you cannot see through it. And some are semi. Acrylics are semi-opaque. So we can use them here as in a glaze over a dark ground and then you can gradually build up those glazes and almost see through them. Here with using acrylics again you can see how I've worked over a dark base gradually building those acrylics up and using the opaque heavier paint over the top. Watercolours are a very good example of transparent paint, but even some colours in watercolours are more transparent than others, and we need to learn those. I will demonstrate these techniques in more detail later, but we can drop the paint in, wet into wet, so it mixes in itself. We can glaze it over another colour. There are so many ways of using these different techniques to get brighter colours. Here with the opaque pastels you can see that we can work pastels over a dark ground, letting that ground show through in a semi-opaque way as well. This pastel and then going into the watercolour very clearly show the differences between an opaque surface and a transparent surface here with the flowers.
it can be a very good exercise to use a limited palette to understand colour and make colour really work. Here I show you just a few colours that you can use with a maximum effect. It may be a good thing to try these before using a huge palette of colours where you get into a total mess and confusion. This can be done with any medium and here are a couple of examples in watercolour having just shown you that girl in the bedroom in acrylics. Rembrandt also used this and used the technique of chiaroscura or light and dark. Colour will also play a very important part in perspective or giving the illusion of distance. There are two types of perspective. Linear perspective which is this one where lines appear to go into the distance to a vanishing point and give us that distance. And then there is also aerial perspective which is all about colour. As a basic rule for making a good painting, baking the cake, it's warmer in the foreground, cooler in the distance, in more detail and focus in the foreground and less detailed or hazier in the distance. This is partly because of the atmosphere. When I say atmosphere I mean as in mist. In the air there are little water droplets and these make things misty. So in the Mediterranean where it's much drier the air is clearer, we see further, it is brighter into the distance. In England, for instance, usually or Scotland, it's much hazier and the light is duller, so it's mistier into the distance. The exceptions to the rule here would be in sunrise or sunset, where it's cool in the foreground and warm in the distance. This means that objects are usually larger in the foreground and smaller in the distance. It also depends on the size and scale of things in your picture. The Dutch, for instance, used to have a lot in the sky because the landscape's very flat, and in many English scenes we see a lower horizon level and more in the foreground and less in the sky. OK, I've talked about the basics of warm against cool and light against dark in perspective. Now let's talk about texture and how we got the rough against the smooth. And that will help to give us distance and also play against light. So we have light shining over surfaces as well. And that can give us the effect of distance too, with soft skies and rough textured beaches or foregrounds. Here we've got two prime examples of how we can play the smooth against the rough. The smoothness of the mist and the water against the texture of the twigs and branches in those trees. And then here the surf and the sparkling ripples and spray against the children on the softer sky. It doesn't matter which medium you're using, these textures are very important. But of course the application of those textures is very different, as in this oil painting and now this watercolour. How you keep your colours clean and how you apply them will differ with each different technique and medium you're using. Here are a series of works on the same theme, a ballet dancer, using many different mediums and ways of working. So before I go on to doing individual demonstrations of each of the pieces of work that the student has sent me, I want to go on to demonstrating how to get nice, pure, clean colours, mixing them and placing them onto the canvas or surface. As I say, there are so many ways to do this, and there's no one right and wrong, but there are definitely mistakes that you can make, and definitely things that can go wrong, and I'll try and warn you about those, and show you ways that are very successful. Well, we're back now to actually start on the practical part of this film. Here's a, a piece I did with the class this last Wednesday. We're doing uh, different ways of working in pastel. In this case, it was um, China Graph pencil, watercolour and pastel as you'll see in more detail later in the film. So now I want to actually start doing individual um, demonstrations on the watercolour, on the pastel, on the acrylic inks, on the acrylics, uh, just to show you how we can lay the paint. But first of all we have to discuss what we're going to lay the paint on, what surface are we going to use, and there are many different surfaces. Let's have a look at some now. We've got pastel papers with glass paper, with ordinary pastel paper, we can use pastels on watercolour paper as we're seeing here. Any surface that is matte will take a pastel. Um, and there's a great difference between oil pastels and, and, and uh, soft pastels, of course. We're going to be dealing only with soft pastels. So we'll have a look at how we can use soft pastels. We can put paint onto almost any surface, as long as it again is matte, it needs to be primed. So MDF is great because it's cheap, it's firm, it's solid, it's probably more durable than canvases. Canvas, of course, and canvas comes in different surfaces and textures. And we're going to go on to talking about textures in watercolour paper as well, because watercolour paper, as you can see here, uh, I'll show you now, has different surfaces too. There is knot, there is rough, there is the smooth, which is hot press. So the smooth, which is hot press on the surface, then we've got knot, which is not either, which is also called cold pressed. And then we've got rough and extra rough on surfaces. And these surfaces make a great deal of difference because how we lay the paint over the surface, how we lay the paint into the, into the actual paper and then can go over the surface in a dry brush technique, as you can with canvas, 
as you can with texture. We're going to talk about textures as well, how we can use um, paint over textures, paint into textures, to get a broken colour effect as we've already seen in the basics that we've just done. Broken colour as in the Impressionists, letting one colour shine through another. Then we've got ways of laying paint into each other, next to each other, of blending, and so on and so on. And we'll deal with each of those in each of the mediums in some depth. And then at the very end of all of these little demonstrations, we'll finally we'll do these pieces of artwork from Trevor, and we'll have a little go at just uh, doing them as I would have possibly approached them. Um, many of you have approached them differently. Remember, any artwork, any artwork at all, can be approached in a dozen or so different ways, and a multitude of different ways. So uh, each medium having its own way and its own way of bringing the special effects out or the paint you're using, whether it's luminosity or watercolour or texture of paint or whatever. So I'm just going to use one different idea for each of these that I think would possibly suit them better. And he wanted, Trevor particularly wanted, to me to bring out the colours in things, to get the brightness, the vibrancy. So that's what we're really concentrating on now is freshness of colour. We could work in tone, we could work in pen, we could work in drawing. No, in this case we're working about colour, so we're working about the lights and darks, the vibrancy of colour, the colour intensity, the opposite of the colour circle, the luminosity and so on. We're dealing with those. We'll start off with acrylic inks. Now, unfortunately, all my acrylic inks are over in France, so I'm going to have to use watercolours just to explain some of this business about acrylic inks. Acrylic inks are wonderfully fluid. They're just like watercolour, except they're much, much stronger. They're slightly opaque, in other words, they're not completely transparent like watercolour, um, but we use them in the same way. The only big difference is that when they dry, they won't wet again. So we have to keep them wet whilst we're working with them by using a fine spray. And whilst they're damp, you can still work into them or lift them or work into them to a degree. Once they're dry, you can work acrylic paint over them or all sorts of things there, and that's up to you. And you can even use acrylic inks on canvas. So we can stay in canvas and we can do wet into wet on canvas, especially if you do a couple more coats of prime to make the canvas smoother or work onto MDF that's been primed. We can get the same sorts of effects with the acrylic inks and brightness that we can get with watercolour and then use acrylics or oils over those. So acrylic inks, very versatile, very bright, and here's some examples that, are, that I've done with them. <clears throat> word about brushes and things and applicators for putting paint on. Here I've got a small sponge roller which I'm going to be using later with the acrylics as well. This is one for watercolour. Shinograph pencils, rubber and pencil of course. We've got rake brushes, we've got hate brushes, we've got sponges, we've got filberts, wash brushes, round brushes, rigger brushes. These are all my watercolour set and all of these brushes are fairly soft. They range from being very soft to medium. We haven't got any very hard ones because that would lift the paint off rather than put it on. And it's similar with the acrylics and oil painting brushes. We've got painting knives here for putting the paint on as well, textural pieces like um, forks and so on, flat brushes, and my filberts and rounds here. But these brushes are all a medium consistency, medium to soft. Um, they don't go too stiff because I don't want to lift paint off. I need a strong enough brush to be able to put the paint on, the thicker paint on, but also delicate enough to be able to use glazes to be able to tickle the paint, to be able to treat the paint tenderly. So I like my oil and acrylic brushes to be of medium consistency, ranging from medium to softer. And I very seldom use very, very stiff brushes, unless I need to get into very heavy textural work, in which case I'd use a heavier brush, a heavier bodied brush, to handle the, the rough textures, because they'd, be, they'd wreck the good ones instantly. So over here we've got a large selection of brushes for watercolour, a larger selection of different types of brush. And the softer brushes will lay the paint into the paper better, and the stiffer brushes will go over the surface more. <laughs> 